Rangeland management is a lot about habitat management, habitat management for wildlife and for livestock. And in the, today's discussion in integrated rangeland management, we'll talk about habitat requirements of animals, and that will lead to discussion about how we might manage those. Habitat is a term that's used a lot of different ways, but as we've discussed in this class, it's simply the home of an animal, and it includes biotic factors such as food and, and other animals and microbes, and then it also includes some abiotic factors such as climate and topography, and then edaphic factors, which are soil. So all of those are things that affect the life of an animal and they affect the home of the animal. So those would be elements of habitat at the most basic level. Uh, now I'm gonna go through the four uh, components of habitat uh, that are well described are water, food, cover, space. Let's start with water. So let's start by taking a little closer look at water. Water is certainly very important to animals, all, all animals, and it's a very basic element of habitat requirements. However, it varies immensely depending on the animal species, the, the weight of the animal, the type of animal, and also depending on weather and climate factors. Let's start with the animal. Um, just some general um, numbers. Sheep and goats drink one to one and a half gallons um, and they can drink every other day. So they could drink uh, a couple gallons every other day and meet their requirement. Uh, donkeys and horses drink, uh, say, four to eight gallons, depending on how heavy they are. And they generally drink once or twice a day. So it's hard for them to um, uh, go with more than once a day for water. Cattle generally drink water at least once a day, eight to 10 gallons for a beef cow out on the range. Bison of about the same weight also drink eight to 10 gallons, but they also are known to be able to drink every other day. Uh, the, num the amount that any of these animals drinks does depend on their physiology and then also on weather and climate conditions. Remember, one of the important factors that influences water consumption is that there's quite a lot of water in forage. Immature forage, young forage, growing forage actually has a lot of water in it. For example, immature grass can have up to 75% water. So if you just do the math, if you had an animal that ate 26 pounds of young green growing forage, it would consume two and a half gallons of water. So that would go quite a ways in meeting its water requirement. There have been some studies in the plains, like in Kansas and Oklahoma, where um, beef steers uh, graze the growing wheat crop. So early in the spring, they'll be they'll graze these this really actively growing wheat. And they found out that um, those young animals actually don't even need water. They're getting so much water from that young growing grass that you don't have to provide water. Of course, everyone mostly does provide water because it's a good humanitarian effort to make sure the animals have plenty of water. But most of the water that they get is right from the forage. Other factors that affect um, the demand for water that animals have, the first and most prevailing factor will be weather. Hot temperatures especially really increase the demand for water. Just think of yourself on a hot day. You, drink, you can drink a lot of water. You can drink a gallon of water in the summer, and it'd be very hard to drink a gallon of water in the cool days of winter. So the temperature makes a lot of difference because the animal has high demand for water when the temperature is hot. Physiological state is also really important, especially if you're look at, looking at lactating uh, mother uh, animals, uh, cows, sheep, goats. If they're lactating, uh, they have a high, much higher uh, water demand than non-lactating or dry animals. Uh, la water is also important as a habitat feature, not only from the amount of water that animals need, but also from how it affects animal use of the landscape. So we know that uh, riparian areas such as streams and creeks uh, might be sources or real magnets of use, especially in hot times, seeps and wetlands or uh, what they call uh, lentic water systems also can be very important to meet water demand, but also just as a magnet for animal use at certain times of year. Let's now turn focus to food uh, as a habitat requirement. Of course, animals need food to meet their growth and maintenance requirements. Uh, we've always divided in this class talk about energy, which is provided by cellulose or structural carbohydrates, but also starches, sugars, and fats. And this influences um, how productive animals are, but also where they might graze and the quality of habitat. Nutrients that we might keep our eye on would be things like protein levels, or that's compounds that, can, that contain nitrogen. Um, but mineral, vitamins in the food, especially vitamin A, D, and E, uh, because those are um, vitamins that are fat soluble and they um, become very limiting in the winter. And other minerals, we mostly think about phosphorus and potassium and calcium in the case of range animals. Selenium to some degree can be very important in certain places. 
So when we're trying to assess the quality of habitat for an animal, we're trying to assess how much energy and nutrients it provides for the animal. We talked a lot about how much animals eat, so assessing habitat quality also uh, re requires that there's plenty of forage there for animals to meet their intake demand. And just a summary, uh, monogastrics or concentrate selectors like birds, bears, mice, etc. Um, they need they eat three to ten percent of their body weight per day, um, just depending on their the type of animal they are. Ruminants, as you know, we've talked about them, ruminants eating two and a half to three and a half percent of their body weight per day on an annual basis. That would include bison, deer, elk, cattle, sheep, goats, etc. Um, hind gut fermenters like horses and rabbits eat three and a half to six percent of their body weight per day. So if you're going to start looking at habitat features, you're going to uh, look at how much forage is there to meet those intake demands. The actual food that's out there can also be classified or thought of in a few different ways. One, we often look for, for plants that are highly preferred. They're, they're more abundant in the animal's diet than they are available. So in other words, the animal is selecting them and, and including them in their diet. So that would be a preferred food. We might look for habitat quality based on preferred foods. A staple food is just eaten on a regular basis to meet the nutrient requirements. It's not really sought or preferred, it's just eaten in high quantities. Emergency foods would be things that are very, very rarely eaten, but they might fulfill a short-term nutritional demand. They're generally low in forage quality, but they have some, so it'd be like really dead standing grass, which doesn't have very much quality. In an emergency situation, animals would be relying on that for energy. There are some times you'll see animals eating things that are just really of no value at all, and they're just trying to fill their gut. They're just trying to put something in the gut. So that's the, the worst category of plants would be what we just call fill. And the, the, things like wood, just things that are not valuable to the animal, but they're just filling, the, filling their gut. If your goal as a range manager is to manage food resources, then you start to look at the land base and the food requirements at the same time. You need to know what vegetation is out there. You might assess and monitor that, but you also need to know the diet preferences and requirements of animals that you're interested in managing for. Remembering that some animals uh, will require different things, so it's hard to please all the critters all the time, but you need to make a decision on what you're gonna manage for and know what their, the preferences and requirements of that animal is. Also need to pay attention to the spatial arrangement of food. Food is important, but it also needs to be in a place where animals can also access water because they, they need food and water. Uh, especially for wildlife species, it's important to have food that is near cover to avoid predation so, or to, to provide thermal cover. So the relationship of food to other resources in the environment is also important. Okay, now let's turn our attention to cover. I mentioned thermal cover, that is either shade in the summer or it could be shelter from wind in the winter, cold wind in the winter. And this is a graph that's out of a habitat management guidelines. Uh, and it's, it's cool the, the way that they think about optimal cover, which is cover right around the animal if a deer was sitting, but also above the animal to hold warm air in or to provide shade in the summer. And then in the case of thermal cover in the winter, having forage all around the animal provides cover. And then the, the bottom two pictures are just examples of not much cover at all. So you might look at the landscapes around you if you're trying to provide for an animal, look at what their shelter and thermal requirements are, and you could assess whether you're, the land that you're managing has the thermal requirements for, for a specific animal. The other kind of cover is hiding cover or protection from predators. And protection of, from predators actually comes in two different forms. So the first is what we call visual obstruction. So it's where an animal hunkers down in the vegetation to provide visual obstruction. If you're a hunter, you probably know quite a lot about how well animals can get inside of vegetation and be unseen. And so, so animals are really good at finding that visual obstruction. Other animals, however, there's another category of animals that actually need a lack of visual obstruction to protect themselves from herbivores. So these would be animals like pronghorn and prairie dogs. They actually work really hard to keep out in the open so they can see predators coming. So in this case, uh, good cover from predators is actually the lack of cover, so the lack of visual obstruction. So it really depends on the animal and their life strategy to determine what type of cover they need to protect themselves from, from predators. The last of those four categories of habitat that we'll cover is space. 
Space is a little difficult to kind of envision, but it's very important for specific uh, parts of an animal's life history. For example, breeding and nesting. There are cases uh, where the range just might not provide really adequate high quality spaces for nesting. So um, making sure there's enough space uh, around the animal to nest or fawn or have their young or provide for their young is important. We'll talk about what home range is and territories. Those are also specific requirements the animal has for space. Some animals are very socially intolerant of having other animals, especially some kinds, in their space. Uh, they have sort of a distance that they'll stay from other animals. And then the last, another reason, not the last, but another reason that space might be important is for disease transmission. You'll see if anim as animals start to share common space, there might be more disease transmission. So now we know the four elements of habitat, and the next step is to think about where do actually animals actually reside and carry out their life. That would be an, an aspect of habitat selection. Habitat selection is the act of selecting a specific habitat or a specific space among all habitats available. Uh, one term you might think of is the potential range or potential habitat uh, that animals have. That's the area that contains all of the elements necessary for growth and reproduction. It doesn't mean that they actually live there. It's just the area on a map that would have all of the food and water and space and, and resources for cover that are necessary. The actual or the occupied range, that is the area that where animals actually currently exist. Another term that comes in a lot as we start to look at animals is the historic range, the area that they once occupied. And all of these are important when you're trying to think about management of land uh, in terms of understanding what are what is your land uh, uh, particular potential for species and other is just what animals occur there now. Thinking of habitat quality, uh, one way to look at it is to think about what the habitat is limiting. Remember that a limiting factor, that's a basic requirement that limits the size, growth, and or quality of an animal, animal population. And you can think of this as a slatted barrel um, and a, a habitat needs all of these requirements to meet the animal's life strategy or its, its life requirements. But if the habitat is short of food, then, then that's what's going to limit the habitat. If it's short of water or space or cover, that's what limits the habitat or makes it of a low quality. So it's not just um, a component. You, you can't have really good food and, uh, and then have limited water. The, the limited water is what would drive the um, the value of that habitat. Now, if we can identify the limiting factors in habitat, we can remove them. One thing we could do is limit them. We could take take away the, the limiting factors. For example, we could feed animals in the winter when there's not enough food. We could create guzzlers or water sources for animals. Uh, we could um, make crossings or making ways through so, some topographic limitations. So we as humans have the ability to remove some of these limiting factors. That's a kind of dangerous thing because I got to show you this video from Tex Creek Wildlife Management Area. This is a wildlife management area just east of Idaho Falls. And in 2016, if you remember, it was really a bad winter. And there were a lot of deer and elk that were starting to be really emaciated and, and uh, getting out on roads and, and getting into people's yards and eating their the, the plants in their yards and in their hay fields. So it was causing quite a problem, quite a conflict between wildlife and people. So Fish and Game in Idaho decided to... Uh, feed animals at this Texas Creek Wildlife Management Area. It was the largest uh, feeding in uh, Idaho, the, this largest event that was ever accomplished in Idaho. And just look at uh, one day in the life of feeding elk in 2016.
So this was a really important feeding effort. It certainly uh, saved the lives of a lot of elk and deer. Um, it, it reduced a lot of conflict. It has created other problems, though, because now those elk want to come back year after year, and they're um, not wanting to leave the range to go out, the, the, the feeding area to go out on winter range. So it caused some problems, but it did solve an immediate situation. Remember that we as humans not only remove limiting factors, sometimes we add them, such as fences and roads would be two really good examples where we might limit the quality of a habitat just by limiting access of animals to that habitat. Home range is another concept that's important to land managers. It's the area in which an individual animal conducts its normal annual activity. Uh, this is a picture from uh, a website that looked at coyote use and and you can see this sort of a blue line where uh, animals use the, these larger areas the home range is that dotted blue line but inside of that you can see other territories or other areas that are important um, so you could develop a map like this for many animals that are on a specific wildlife management area or a specific ranch or any management unit that you're in charge of or that you're working with Habitat selection is that act of making decisions about where to uh, reside. Home range is that area in which an animal conducts its normal activities. And then some elements about a home, home range that are important. One is that it can be shared with other individuals, especially other individuals of the same species. It is directly related to um, body size. Larger animals need larger home ranges. Also, the kind of animal is also important. Carnivores have really large um, home ranges. Omnivores smaller herbivores least, except some herbivores can have very large um, yearly migrations to higher and lower elevations, which can, can kind of expand the home range. It also varies by diet habits, whether you, animals eat uh, plants or animals or a combination, and it also um, can be affected by human encroachment. That's the greatest effect on animals, is largely on their home range. Territory is a little bit different than that. Territory is an area that animals will defend, usually a breeding or rearing of young areas. So animals may have home ranges and within that, a part of it might be a territory. One animal that does have a very defined territories that they will defend against others is wolves. This graph on the right is a, a map of wolf pack territories. So they actually defend a certain area that where they reside from other packs in the area. So it's it's um, exclusive to an individual or to a unit. Many animals don't have territories, but some do. And if they do, again, it needs to be kept in mind when managing habitat. So we know that animals have home ranges and territories, and it's important that they have home ranges because it allows the animal to be familiar with the food resources in that area so they can start to learn which plants are toxic and which are nutritious. They can also develop foraging skills that are selective to the plants in their home range. Um, it also helps them uh, get, um, reduce the risk of predation because they know where predators might be and they, and they, they know where good cover resources to reduce the risk of predation are. So there's good reasons that animals stay close to home and that they have a home range that's pretty well defined. Are there any disadvantages? Well, in fact, there are some disadvantages because uh, just because you have an area you're familiar with doesn't mean that it's the best area to provide for your yearly requirements. So there's a trade-off between not knowing all the area around and being able to select the perfect area and, um, and selecting an area and becoming familiar with it.
three aspects of habitat use that are kind of interesting. One is a term called philopatry. That's the love of a particular place. And this time it's in, in this case, it might be referring to one's homeland or one's place of rearing. Animals often have an affinity for the place where they grew up, the place where they were reared. Some species, such as salmon, that propensity to be near to go back to the place where you were reared that philopatry is so strong that there's no other place that is acceptable for mating except if they're back at the at the stream where they uh, that they, where they uh, were born um, predation is also an interesting point that um, it does affect the quality of habitat it affects habitat selection but it's really difficult to measure so animals do have a sense of risk of predation uh, it's very difficult to account for in, in us looking at the habitat or even in the animal. Also remember that the quality of information that animals have to assess habitat is not perfect. Perfect habitat selection would require perfect habitat information. And there's many reasons why animals do not know what is the perfect habitat. They don't know all the habitat available. They may not be able to assess the quality of habitat. And then finally, um, they may not know the risk of predation, which would be a really difficult thing to assess and all of these are changing over time. So habitat use, uh, what natural events or challenges uh, the qual quality of habitat. So what things could happen in the environment that would change the quality of habitat that are outside of the animal's control. And that, then think about what human activities um, could challenge the quality of habitat and for either better or for worse. So go through your mind, think about some things in your environment that are affecting, especially in this case, wildlife habitat. And that's a short look at habitat requirements. Next, let's talk about habitat selection.